Good morning. Welcome to chapel, you all. For those of you who are a guest today, we are absolutely delighted you're here. And for those of you who are getting into the regular routine of chapel as we begin the spring term, uh, we're grateful. It is my joy, my honor today to introduce Dr. Steve Moore. Steve holds a bachelor's degree from McMurray, having also studied at Washington University a master's from St. Andrews, a master's of divinity from Asbury, and then the PhD from the University of Michigan. Steve is the CEO emeritus of the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust and a senior consultant for Baylor's Truett Seminary. I love to say the latter phrase. Steve is working with us in these days in areas of advancement, in our Wesley House of Studies, as well as in the program for the Future Church. Speaking of the program for the Future Church, uh, following chapel, for those of you who have signed up for a luncheon, uh, it will be next door and we will go to it in the Great Hall after uh, Jessalyn's benediction. And in the event that you have not signed up, but you would like to show up, if you wouldn't mind to just kind of uh, uh, move to the back of the line, let's make sure that those who have signed up are served and then uh, there should be plenty, uh, typically is. So here this is an invitation to come along please for lunch, a conversation that Dr. Binnick will lead with uh, Dr. Moore following our service this morning. Well, Steve, as he will ask you to call him, has served in key roles in Christian higher education, including as executive director of the Wesley Foundation at Texas Tech University, vice president for campus life at Seattle Pacific University, watch this one, uh, vice president for student life at Baylor University from 1998 to 2002, then Asbury stole Steve uh, to serve as senior vice president and president of the Asbury Foundation. And then uh, latterly, Steve has been at Murdoch Charitable Trust. Steve is married to Than. They live in Portland, Oregon. They uh, brought with them this weather for which we're grateful. And they have three grown children, Madison, Megan, and Molly, who serves as assistant director uh, for Baylor in Washington. So all kinds of connections, as I'm inclined to say, the kingdom of God runs along relational rails, and so it seems to be yet again. I know that Hannah is here to pray, and Hannah, would you come and offer a word of prayer as we begin to worship? Thank you. Would you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning with expectations. We expect that you are a God who sees us, not as the people that we pretend to be, but the people we truly are, completely broken and beloved by you. God, we expect that you're a God who hears us as we grieve that the world is not as it should be, but rejoice as we glimpse your kingdom here on earth. We expect that you are a God who shows up as a baby in a manger and a king on a cross, that you are unsatisfied to let us do life on our own. God, this morning, would you give us the courage to reject the false things that we've come to expect of you? And would you remind us again in these moments of who you have promised to be? That you are the word and the breath and the truth and the king of kings and the way and the life and the helper and the friend. We ask that in all things this morning, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing to you, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, Truett. Will you stand as we begin to sing this morning? We're going to start with hymn number 486. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. 
And then we will transition to Jesus, you alone. The lyrics are printed in your order of worship for that one. <clears throat> Jesus calls us over the tumult, hymn number 486.
Cause you set the stars in the heavens You set the world into motion Oh, Jesus, you alone Oh, you breathe your life in I've searched the world for a love that could fill my heart, but nothing compares to the wonder of who you are. We sing holy songs. Yes, you shed your blood for salvation. You broke the curse for our freedom. Oh, Jesus, you alone. And you rose from death with the morning. Sing this out. Thanks for that music. That's just beautiful and so great. It is so great to be with you all. Thank you, Todd, for inviting me, and thank you all for welcoming me in. It's just a, a great joy and an honor to get to be with you here at the beginning of a new year. 
and the beginning of a new semester. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I am going to be uh, having scriptures that will be read as we go through our thoughts together. Uh, Dustin Bennick will come and read our first gospel in a, in a few minutes. Uh, he's the head of the, the program of the future church. And then Zach Barber uh, will come and read the next uh, passage at the right time. Zach said to be sure and mention that he's probably the best student at Truett. Uh, not really, he didn't really say that. And then uh, Jen Martinez Ayala will come. And you know Jen runs the seminary, but uh, she will be the one who will come and be the third one to read the scripture. So uh, we'll have those during the, as we think together. So yeah, here it is. The new year and the uh, new semester. Uh, and I have to tell you, it, it, the new year didn't start out great for me. It was a bad bowl season. Uh, I started out, I had made a few bets, I'll confess to you. Um, I made a bet I thought was a sure thing, Texas versus Washington. I live in the Northwest. I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win out of this one. This is a no-brainer, no Texas. And then, of course, their Heisman Trophy guy doesn't even play. And Washington does a beatdown. And I lost bets to people I work with. There's nothing worse than, than losing a bet to people you work with. It's a bad thing. Washington beats Texas. And then I thought, well, Baylor Air Force. I got Baylor. Baylor's going to win that. Air, they're going to pound it. Air Force, and then sure enough, here comes Air Force. They pound Baylor in the bowl game. And my brother is an Air Force Academy grad. And there's nothing worse than losing a bet to your older brother. And so again, I'm on like a 0-2 run here. And then I thought, well, I'm a Michigan alum. You heard that, go blue. I thought Michigan TCU, this is a sure deal. And then, ah. Uh, TCU beats Michigan, and now I have to wear a TCU sweatshirt to my small group three weeks in a row. <laughs> That's the worst thing, wearing a TCU sweatshirt, but then to have to do it in your small group, it just uh, doesn't get worse than that. Uh, so I was not on a good roll. There's got to be a lesson in there. Uh, probably has something to do with betting, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, over the Christmas and New Year, uh, there was a point right after New Year's, we had all of our family together. My son Madison has three little children, all under six. And um, I walked out of the room, uh, having read to Kaya and Sayla, twin three-year-old girls. And as I walked out of the room into the hallway, I had a flashback, and the flashback was when we were in Florida with Than's parents, and my father-in-law walked out of the room having read to my two girls, Megan and Molly, and he walked out of there and had this look on his face, and he said to me, where did the time go? I remember reading to Than and Jennifer. And now I'm reading to Than and Jennifer's children, Megan and Molly. And then I had that flashback. I remember him saying that. And now I'm reading to my son Madison's three-year-old kids. And I thought, where did the time go? And I know as I look out at this group that there are people all across the continuum that would reflect on those stories. You're somewhere in that continuum and you're thinking to yourself about that. And probably many of us are saying to ourselves, where did the time go? My daughter Megan said to me over the holidays, Dad, let's read the book 4,000 Weeks Together. I don't know if you've seen the Oliver Berkman book. It's kind of shot up as a very popular book. It's not a book on time management. It sounds like it, 4,000 Weeks which is the number of weeks approximately that we have in our life to live. And, you know, Berkman has a unique kind of a take on this. 
because he had tried to and had written blogs for Atlantic and others on time management. And he finally said, forget it. He said, all those books are about how do you manage busy and manage being productive. And he said, busy and productive doesn't get you to be the person you want to be. A similar question was asked more than 100 years ago uh, by Sir Leonard Wolfe. You remember Sir Leonard Wolfe. Uh, Sir Leonard Wolfe, one of the most famous guys of his time. I had never heard of Sir Leonard Wolfe. Maybe you know of him, but I, he was mentioned in this Winston Churchill book that I, that I read. He was the f- friend of kings and queens, lords and ladies, kind of a Downton Abbey kind of a guy. And uh, he made this observation at the end of his life. I can see that I have achieved practically nothing. The world today and the history of the human anthill during the last 57 years would be exactly the same as it is if I had played ping pong instead of sitting on committees, writing books and memoranda, and I have therefore to make the rather useless confession to myself and anyone who reads this book that I must have in my long life have ground through between 150,000 and 200,000 hours of perfectly useless work. It's sad, isn't it, that someone could get to that point in their life and yet many people in their lives get to that point and they kind of look back and they say, trivial pursuit. Part of that comes when we fail to ask ourselves tough questions. If we never really reflect on our priorities, on, you know, how is how I'm living reflecting who I am or who I say the Lord of my life would have me, how he would have me to live. The great, one of my great books of last year that I read was uh, Jamie Smith, James K.A. Smith's book, How to Inhabit Time. Fabulous book. I hope that you can put it on a reading list at some point. And part of what uh, Jamie asks the question is that inhabiting time is so much bigger than just something like time management. is how I am living, helping me become more and more who I was created to be. Jesus doesn't mind asking us some tough questions. As he kind of walks across the pages of the Gospels, we see him encountering people, all kinds of people, and he doesn't shy away from getting right to the heart of things. Warning. If you don't want to be asked tough questions, you may want to go elsewhere. Don't dare look to Jesus. Let me just remind us of three of the encounters that Jesus had. There's lots of encounters, and it's interesting as you read the Gospels how many of those encounters have questions in them, and they're penetrating questions. They're they're zeroing in questions, and the ones that we'll talk about get progressively more personal. They get to the heart of things. And so uh, as we begin a new year, begin a new semester, prepare to start afresh, no matter where we find ourselves in our spiritual journey, in our lives, these questions still have application for us. So the first one is found in Mark 10, 46, and Dustin is going to uh, just read that portion of the gospel for us. Then they came to Jericho, and later, as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, a beggar who was blind named Bartimaeus 
the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. So they called the man who was blind, saying to him, Take courage, stand up. He is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And replying to him, Jesus said, What? do you want me to do for you? And the man who was blind said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Thank you, Dustin. So here's Jesus and countering this guy, Bart, who is obviously blind, and he has probably been aware of him before. But he asks this question. What do you want me to do for you? It seems cruel, doesn't it? Really, when you stop and think about it, it seems cruel. Why would he ask a blind guy, well, what do you want me to do for you? But the truth is, It's not unusual for people to get in a routine. It says Bart had been sitting there for many years on the side of the road. Sometimes people get in a rut. They just keep doing the same thing day in, day out, week in, week out. And all of a sudden you're a few years along and, well, you're in the same spot. And you say, what am I doing? And Jesus says, hey, Bart, what do you want me to do for you? How desperate are you? How much do you really want things to change? Let me be clear, Bart. What is the change that you want? Sometimes it's really clear to us where our need is. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get frozen. I get stuck. We know we need to make a change to declare our need, and that takes some courage in itself. It's a lot easier and more comfortable uh, when we just kind of keep on going through the motions, when we just stay put when we sort of maintain control ourselves. We love to control things, don't we? So let me ask you a question. Let me ask me a question. What do you want Jesus to do? My friend Dan and I were talking, and his kids at that particular point were in that pre-adolescent stage, 11 and 12 He had just learned that he was getting a new boss. He thought he was going to get the promotion. Instead, somebody else did. Now he had a new boss. He said to me, leaned over the lunch table, and he said, my kids just don't even want to be around me. And he said, it seems to me at this point in our lives, my wife is mad at me all the time. And he said, my new boss, I am pretty sure, because I also applied for that job, I'm pretty sure she's not going to like me. And God doesn't seem to be helping me out here. And I leaned back over the table and I said, Dan, what do you want Jesus to do? And he very quickly said, fix it. And I said, Dan, (laughs) that's the magic genie. That's not God. And I can remember times like that in my own life. Can you? Can you remember times in your life you've said, God, just fix it. What do you want Jesus to do? The second person, remember these get progressively more intrusive questions. The second person we want to look at is one that encounters Jesus 
And he really had not planned to encounter Jesus. And this story is found in Luke 19, and Zach's going to read that one for us. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Jesus stood up and said, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Thanks, Zach. Now there are two very clear descriptors in this passage about Zacchaeus. It says that he was a tax collector and that he was rich. He was curious about Jesus, but I think it's safe to say he really never expected that Jesus would call him out and not only call him out, but Jesus would pursue him and seek to engage him. He was really just planning on being an observer, kind of a spectator, a, a you know, watching this thing to see what this Messiah God guy was all about. But he wanted to do that from a distance. Now, if you read this passage clearly and read it a couple of times, you'll say to yourself, there's not a clear question here. There's not an obvious question. But there are some very clear implied questions. Let me just mention one of them that, that I discovered. And it's a question that is this. So how is life working out for you, Zach? How's life working out for you? There's a very obvious implied brokenness in Zach and the way he has chosen to live his life. He's chosen a profession that is exploitive. He's uh, obviously got some relational brokenness all around him with his own people and with the people that he encounters. And he has what appears to operate out of some deep insecurities and some compromised personal ethics. In short, he's a guy who has money and he has some power and it's not buying him what he hoped. Uh-oh, there's another tough question. How's life working out for you? Are you satisfied that you are being fully the person that God created you to be? Are you aware of the brokenness in your own life? As you start this new year, you find yourself not completely sure where to go from here? Curious about God, but kind of from a distance? Here's a short video that speaks to brokenness in a beautiful and a helpful way to me. And maybe it will to you as well. It's by a friend that some of you may have encountered in a, a, a friend of mine named Mako Fujimura. The world is predicated upon 
mending what is broken. And this reality of how the Skintsugi bowl is more valuable than the original uh, really speak to the uh, restorative, redemptive process um, of the gospel. Kintsugi is this art form of mending, uh, broken shards of pottery. Kin means gold and tsugi means to mend, so you are reconnecting the broken pieces, but doing it in a way that is, that is beautiful and uh, it's an art form of its own. Kintsugi speaks about conditions of trauma and brokenness, ground zero conditions valuing what you have rather than this disposable culture. Kintsugi is not just fixing, but it's, it's creating into an opportunity um, of brokenness. And so that is a redemptive journey uh, that leads to new creation. で、10年ぐらい前からワークショップをやってたんですけど、あの、やっぱり震災が一度あってね、311の時に、その後すごい注文が突然増えたんですよ。だけど結局ちょっと落ち着いた時に、あの、何を直そうかっていうと、意外と
本当に世界の見え方が全部変わってくる感じがすごいするんですよ。あの完璧に仕上げるよりもちょっと未完成な方がさっきまでボロボロだと思った器にこう黄金の川が流れてるっていうふうに自分がこう感じるようになってくるんですよね。Can so he reminds us that sometimes instead of throwing away things of the past,、um, that it's it's good to work to mend、um, and to do it beautifully. To me, how the gospel reads is Christ came not just to fix us, but but to Restore us to create something new,、um, which is more valuable than what we began with. So here's the thing that I want us to be clear of here today. There's not a person in this room who's not broken, flawed, in need of healing, having had hurts. The difference, the thing that really separates out,、uh, are those who are willing to say, I am broken. I've been wounded. I'm hurting. And they invite Jesus to come and dine with them. And then those that hide, hoping that no one notices that brokenness. And if no one notices it, they're hiding out. And they just continue to try to control and manage that brokenness in their lives. The last place that any of us want to go is those places where our fears and our insecurities, our wounds, which sometimes are self imposed and sometimes they're imposed by others. And so, where we often want to go is just go to being religious, religious activity. And we may use money or we may use. Degrees or titles or position or power or something else that might mask or we think maybe will kind of hide that brokenness. And then we just continue on thinking maybe with a little tweak here, a little management here, then uh, occasionally uh, I can get through this without anyone being aware. But Jesus has a question for us, and he won't let it go. He keeps coming at us with this question How's life working out for you? You g o i n g to come down out of that tree? Now, the third person is a person who part of his story is told in John 3. And Jen is g o i n g to come read that Jen 3 passage for us. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. 
So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? So if Zach was hiding out, then this next guy, Dick, is a very sincere guy. In fact, a very religiously sincere guy and a very religiously sincere, busy guy. But frankly, his religious activity is not cutting it. But you have to admire a guy like Dick. You have to admire him. When he has questions, he at least has the guts to come and ask them even if it's going to seem a little bit foolish. He's, he's a guy that should really know, but he's willing to kind of step forward. And Jesus does not tease him about his questions. Jesus does tease him a little bit about some of his religious activity, and, and that teasing is gentle but, but provocative. And there are two things that I think are really important to be said at this point. And the first thing is this. God welcomes honest questions. God is not afraid of your or my questions. Honest questions and honest doubts lead us to know him better and in honest ways. He rejoices and welcomes honest questions. However, we humans, we can also use questions as a diversionary tactic to evade really letting the penetrating questions get through. I've met a lot of people who have a pet set of questions that are built in and ready to divert attention and not let anything get too personal uh, to them, where they are in their life, or their unwillingness to change or grow, or frankly, just to, to deal with, with things as they are in their life. He welcomes honest questions, but God is sort of doesn't have time for dishonest questions. The second thing that I would say is, Pursuing God will change us. It'll change the way we spend our time. It'll change the way we invest and engage in relationship. But Jesus is very clear here. It's not about religious activity. I've met a lot of religious people that have gotten saved at camp or were active in their church or they were active in Young Life or FCA, and then they sort of got on the religious treadmill and they just kind of kept going. All of a sudden, they found themselves in a Christian university or a seminary or someplace like that. And they have great memories of some of those things, but, well, that was, uh, that was an easier time. You know, I love the skits. I love the singing, all those kinds of things. But life gets complicated and challenging. And you sort of just have to go on with life and not get too caught up in all that emotional, the stuff that just, you know, kind of moves you in, the, in your heart. People have sought religious vocations, uh, in fact, in that regard. And yet the startling question that Jesus asked Nick is, Nick, did you think all this religious activity, all these religious appearances were going to bring you close to me? I told you at the beginning, the questions get progressively more and more penetrating, more dangerous to deal with. Anytime we start getting a little closer, Jesus starts asking these, these tough and these troubling questions, challenging questions, questions that sort of stick with us and they get in our mind and they keep rolling around and they, 
they force us to think as much as we try to get rid of them. The real challenge is these kinds of questions and really being able to hear what Jesus is saying to us. Well, here's the news that Bart and Zach and Nick and others and you and I, this is what we can go to the bank on. Jesus won't let us go because he loves us. He won't let you go because he loves you. His greatest desire is for you to be whole, to be fully who you were created to be. He knows that hurt. He knows that pain. He knows that insecurity. He wants to meet you there. He wants to come to your house and dine with you. What God is asking of you is that you give as much of yourself as you understand right now to as much of him as you understand right now and that you keep on doing that as you go forward in your life. He wants to walk with us in the joys and the sorrows in the hurts, in the pains, the insecurities. He wants to use you. Imagine this. He wants to use you as a person in the world, in your family, among your friends, at work, in church. He wants to use you in a unique way that if it's not fulfilled. It won't be done. You are a unique, unrepeatable miracle of God. And he wants to use you in ways that are unique and unrepeatable and will cause miracles. These questions uh, just hang out there for us. For each one of us and it calls for us to respond it will continue to be with us no matter where we find ourselves in this day or in this new semester or in this week or in our journey or in 2023 Jesus is asking us so how's it working out for you what do you want me to do do you want me to be with you? Let me pray for us. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for these three brave souls that put themselves out there and received questions that penetrate and ripple down through history right here into Truett Seminary Chapel and into our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds, that we might receive not only those questions, but that we would engage and invite you into our home of our lives with all the complexity, all the challenges, all the uncertainty, and we pray that you would help us to know and experience the fullness of what it means for you to accompany us in our lives. Thank you for these friends, for the people around them, because we know how critical it is through professors, through staff, through classmates, through friends, through others who come into our lives, sometimes for a short time, sometimes for a longer time, that help us to be able to receive and to understand the fullness of your truth and grace. We pray for this new semester. We pray that you would be with each one here guide their steps, help them to know you in a way that they never expected to know. 
and be present in this place in ways far beyond anyone's imagination. For we pray together in your name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me? We're going to respond to these questions from Jesus uh, with praise and gratitude. But uh, we're going to sing the doxology together as we go out, and then Jessalyn can come and dismiss us with a benediction. Praise God from all who all blessings flow. Receive this benediction from the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and ever. Amen. Go in peace.